Good evening, friends, fiends, and night owl supremes. Welcome to A Bit Late, where tonight we are uncovering the origin story of the opal. You may know that opal is October stone, but apart from the O, what do they have in common? Like, usually I think of October as spooky month with oranges and purples and blacks, or, you know, yellows, anything autumny, <laughs> folly, end of harvest, end of season y. But the opal is a very light and bright stone. Tonight, we'll be reading the story of the opal, with some commentary throughout. And a little warning, it's so cute. There's fairies and little ladies, sunbeams and moonbeams, talking birds. It's that kind of story. It gets really sad, just a little heads up. But it's so romantic and tragic. Oh, it's a lovely little tale. So, I hope you enjoy listening to this opalescent lore. You might never look at them the same way again. Do get comfy and cozy, relaxed, gather blankets and pillows about you, summon your familiars, get your tea, light your candles, and turn on your fairy lights for tonight's story, the story of the opal. The sun was shining brightly one day, and a little sunbeam slid down his long golden ladder and crept unperceived under the leaves of a large tree. All the sunbeams are in reality tiny sun fairies, oh who run down to earth on golden ladders, which look to mortals like rays of the sun. I knew it. I knew there was something up with sunbeams. <laughs> when they see a cloud coming, they climb their ladders in an instant and draw them up after them into the sun. The sun is ruled by a mighty fairy, who every morning tells his tiny servants, the beams, where they are to shine, and every evening counts them on their return to see he has the right number. It is not known, but the sun and moon are enemies. Oh, no. And that is why they never shine at the same time. The fairy of the moon is a woman, and all her beams are tiny women. So the sun gets fairies, and the moon is little women? Who come down on the loveliest little ladders like threats of silver. No one knows why the sun and the moon quarreled. Once they were very good friends, but now... They are bitter enemies, and the sunbeams and moonbeams do not play together. We're going very far back in time for this story. One day, a little sunbeam crept into a tree and sat down near a bullfinch's nest and watched the bullfinch and its mate. Why should I not have a mate also? He said to himself. He was the prettiest little fellow you could imagine. His hair was bright gold, and he sat still, leaning one arm on his tiny ladder and listening to the chatter of the birds. <laughs> Leave it to some bullfinches for relationship goals, right? But I shall try to keep awake tonight to see her, said a young bullfinch. Nonsense, said its mother. You shall do no such thing. But the nightingale said she is so very lovely, said a wren, looking out from her little nest in the hedge close by. The nightingale? said the old bullfinch scornfully. Everyone knows that the nightingale was moonstruck long ago. Who can trust a word, he says. Nevertheless, I should like to see her, said the wren. I have seen her, and the nightingale is right, said a wood dove in its soft cooing tones. I was awake last night and saw her. She is more lovely than anything that has ever came here before. Of whom are you talking? asked the sunbeam, and he shot across to the bullfinch's nest. All the birds were silent when they saw him. At last the bullfinch said, Only of a moonbeam, your highness. No one your highness would care about. For the bullfinch remembered the quarrel between the sun and the moon and did not like to say much. That's either a really old bullfinch, or this story is very new and this is a fresh happening, or bullfinches passed down tales for a long time. They have a strong story tradition. Hmm. What is she like? asked the sunbeam. I've never seen a moonbeam. I have seen her and she is as beautiful as an angel, said the wood dove. But you should ask the nightingale. He knows more about her than anyone, for he always comes out to sing to her. Where is the nightingale? asked the sunbeam. He is rusting now, said the wren and will not say a word, but later, as the sun begins to set, he will come out and tell you. Oh, buddy, he's got a curfew, though. At the time when all the decent birds are going to roost, grumbled the bullfinch. <laughs> oh, 
Bullfinch. The decent folks are going to roost now. Whatever. Grumbly Bullfinch. I will wait till the nightingale comes, said the sunbeam. So all day long he shone about the tree. As the sun moved down, slowly his ladder dropped with it lower and lower, for it was fastened to the sun at one end. Oh no. And if he had allowed the sun to disappear before he had run back and drawn it up, the ladder would have broken against the earth. <sighs> and the poor little sunbeam could never have gone home again, but would have wandered about, becoming paler and paler every minute, till at last he died. Buddy. But some time before the sun had gone, when it was still shining in a glorious bed of red and gold, the nightingale arose, began to sing loud and clear. Oh, is it you at last, said the sunbeam. How I have waited for you. Tell me quickly about this moonbeam of whom they are talking. What shall I tell you of her, sang the nightingale. She is more beautiful than the rose. She is the most beautiful thing that I have ever seen. Her hair is silver and the light of her eyes is far more lovely than yours. But why should you want to know about her? You belong to the sun and hate moonbeams. I do not hate them, said the sunbeam. What are they like? Show this one to me some night, dear nightingale. I cannot show her to you now, answered the nightingale, for she will not come out till long after the sun has set. But wait a few days, and when the moon is full, she will come a little before the sun sets. And if you hide beneath a leaf, you may look at her. But you must promise not to shine on her, or you might hurt her or break her ladder. I will promise, said the sunbeam. And every day he came back to the same tree at sunset to talk to the nightingale about the moonbeam till the bullfinch was quite angry. You know, the bullfinch is uh, probably not happy about his nest being the meeting spot. Tonight I shall see her at last, he said to himself, for the moon was almost full and would rise before the sun had set. He hid in the oak leaves, trembling with expectation. She's coming, said the nightingale, and the sunbeam peeped out from the branches and watched. In a minute or two, a tiny silver ladder-like thread was placed among the leaves, near the nightingale's nest, and down it came the moonbeam, and our little sunbeam looked out and saw her. She did not look at all as he expected she would, but he agreed with nightingale that she was the loveliest thing he had ever seen. <laughs> I mean, she's a being, not a thing, but you know, whatever. She was all silver and pale greeny blue. Her hair and eyes shone like stars. All the sunbeams looked bright and hot, but she looked as cool as the sea. Yet she glittered like a diamond. The sunbeam gazed at her in surprise, unable to say a word, till all at once he saw that his ladder was bending. <gasps> no! The sun was sinking and he had only just time to scramble back and draw his ladder after him. The moonbeam only saw his light vanishing and did not see him. To whom are you talking, dear nightingale? She asked, putting her beautiful white arms round his neck and leaning her head on his bosom. To a sunbeam, answered the nightingale. Ah, oh, how beautiful he is. I was telling him about you. He longs to see you. I have never seen a sunbeam, said the moonbeam wistfully. I should like to see one so much. And all night long she sat close beside the nightingale with her head leaning on his breast while he sang to her of the sunbeam. And his song was so loud and clear that it awoke the bullfinch, no, who flew into a rage and declared that if it went on any longer she would speak to the owl about it and have it stopped. Oh, not owl for the owl was chief judge and always ate the little birds when they did not behave themselves. <laughs> wow, that's a, a little fun slice of lore right there. But the nightingale never ceased, and the moonbeam listened till the tears rose in her eyes and her lips quivered. Tonight, then, I shall see him, whispered the moonbeam, as she kissed the nightingale and bid him adieu. And tonight he will see you, said the nightingale as he settled to rest among the leaves. All the next day was cloudy, and the sun did not shine. Rats. Poor timing. But towards evening, the clouds passed away, and the sun came forth. And no sooner had it appeared than the nightingale saw our sunbeam's ladder placed close to his nest, and in an instant the sunbeam was beside him. Dear, dear nightingale, he said, 
You are right, she is more lovely than the dawn. I have thought of her all night and all day. Tell me, will she come again tonight? I will wait to see her. Yes, she will come and you may speak to her, but you must not touch her, said the nightingale, and they were silent and waited. Underneath the oak tree lay a large white stone. Here we go. A common white stone, neither beautiful nor useful, for it lay there where it had fallen, and bitterly lamented that it had no object in life. <sighs> oh, buddy, poor lamenting rock. It never spoke to the birds who scarcely knew it could speak. But sometimes, if the nightingale lighted upon it and touched it with his soft breast, or the moonbeam shone upon it, it felt as if it would break with grief that it should be so stupid and useless. What? Poor rock. Never thought I would say that. It watched the sunbeams and moonbeams come down on their ladders and wondered that none of the birds but the nightingale thought the moonbeam beautiful. That evening, as the sunbeam sat waiting, the stone watched it eagerly, and when the moonbeam placed her tiny ladder among the leaves and slid down it, it listened to all that was said. At first, the moonbeam did not speak, for she did not see the sunbeam. How do you not see the sunbeam? I know it's hiding, but... But she came close to the nightingale and kissed it as usual. Have you seen him again? she asked. And on hearing this, the sunbeam shot out from among the green leaves and stood before her. <laughs> I was waiting for my intro, he says. No, he doesn't, but actions spoke louder than words there. For a few minutes, she was silent. You guys have limited time, don't be silent. Then she began to shiver and sob and drew nearer to the nightingale. And if the sunbeam tried to approach her, she climbed up her ladder and went farther still. Do not be frightened, dearest moonbeam, cried he piteously. I would not indeed do you any harm. You are so very lovely and I love you so much. Whoa, buddy, calm down with I love you. The moonbeam turned away, sobbing. I do not want you to leave me, she said, for if you touch me I shall die. It would have been much better for you not to have seen me, and now I cannot go back and be happy in the moon, for I shall always be thinking of you. <sighs> Brats, ill-fated, star-crossed, moon-sun-crossed lovers. I do not care if I die or not now that I have seen you, and see, said the sunbeam sadly, my end is sure, for the sun is fast sinking, and I shall not return to it. I shall stay with you. Go oh, while you have time, cried the moonbeam, but even as she spoke, the sun sank beneath the horizon and the tiny gold ladder of the sunbeam broke with a snap, and the two sides fell to earth and melted away. See, said the sunbeam, I cannot return now, neither do I wish it. I will remain here with you till I die. Oh my gosh, way to put the pressure on, sunbeam. No, no, cried the moonbeam. Oh, I shall have killed you. What shall I do? And look where the clouds are drifting near the moon. If one of them floats across my ladder, it will break it. But I cannot go and leave you here. And she leaned across the leaves to where the sunbeam sat and looked into his eyes. But the nightingale saw a tiny white cloud was sailing close by the moon. That would be risky, right? Like, oh, we have to watch out for clouds all the time. A little cloud no bigger than a spot of white wool, but quite big and strong enough to break the moonbeam's little ladder. Go, go at once, see, your ladder will break, he sang to her, but she did not notice him, but sat watching the sunbeam sadly. For a moment the moon's light was obscured as the tiny cloud sailed past it, and the little silver ladder fell to earth, broken in two, and shrunk away. But the moonbeam did not heed it. Oh, I'm not ready for a sad story, but we've got one. It does not matter, said she, for I should never have gone back and left you here now that I have seen you. So all night long they sat together in the oak tree, and the nightingale sang to them, and the other birds grumbled that he kept them awake. Oh, poo poo. But the two were very happy. I thought they only had minutes to live. Though the sunbeam knew he was growing paler every moment, for he could not live 24 hours away from the sun. Well, good thing it's coming back next morning then, right, buddy? I mean, he doesn't have a ladder, though. But 
but it's a fairy, he can fly. Anyway, when the dawn began to appear, the moonbeam shivered and trembled. The strong sun, she said, would kill me, but I fear something even worse than the sun. See how heavy the clouds are? Surely it is going to rain, and the rain would kill us both at once. Where can we look for shelter before it comes? The sunbeam looked up and saw that the rain was coming. Come, said he, let us go. And they wandered out into the forest and sought for a sheltering place, but every moment they grew weaker. When they were gone, the stone looked up at the nightingale and said, oh, Where did they go? I like to hear them talk, and they are so pretty. They can find no shelter out there, and they will die at once. See, in my side here is a large hole where it is quite dark and into which no rain can come. Fly after them and tell them to come, that I will shelter them. So the nightingale spread his wings and flew, singing, Come back, come back, the stone will shelter you. Come back at once before the rain falls. They had wandered out into an open field, but when she heard the nightingale, the moonbeam turned her head and said, Surely that is the nightingale singing. See, he's calling us. Follow me, sang the bird, back at once to the shelter in the stone. But the moonbeam tottered and fell. Oh, moonbeam, you were almost there. Maybe. I am grown so weak and pale, she said. I can no longer move. Good thing the nightingale can fly. Then the nightingale flew to earth. Climb upon my back, he said, and I will take you both back to the stone. So they both sat down upon his back, and he flew with them to the large stone beneath the tree. I thought it was like a pebble, it's a large stone, hmm. Go in, he said, stopping in front of the hole, and both passed into the hole and nestled in the darkness within the stone. Then the rain began. All day long it rained, and the nightingale sat in his nest half asleep. But when the moon rose, after the sun had set, the clouds cleared away and the air was again full of tiny silver ladders down which the moonbeams came. But the nightingale looked in vain for his own particular moonbeam. She's under the rock. He knew she could not shine on him again, therefore he mourned and sang a sorrowful song. Then he flew down to the stone and sang a song at the mouth of the hole, but there came no answer. So he looked on the hole into the stone, but there was no trace of the sunbeam or the moonbeam, only one shining spot of light where they had rested. Uh huh. Then the nightingale knew they had faded away and died. They could not live away from the sun and the moon, he said. Still, I wish I had never told the sunbeam of her beauty, then she would be here now. When the bullfinch heard of this, she was quite pleased. Oh, hush, bullfinch. Now at least, said she, we shall hear the end of the moonbeam. I'm heartily glad, for I was sick of her. <laughs> Can it, bullfinch? How much they must have loved each other, said the dove. I am glad at least that they died together, and she cooed sadly. But through the stone wherein the beams had sheltered, shot up, bright, beautiful rays of light, silver and gold. They colored it all over with every color of the rainbow, and when the sun or moon warmed it with their light, it became quite brilliant. So that the stone, from being the ugliest thing in the whole forest, became the most beautiful. Oh. Men found it and called it the opal. <laughs> but the nightingale knew that it was the sunbeam and moonbeam who, in dying, had suffused the stone with their mingled colors and light, and the nightingale will never forget them, for every night he sings their story, and this is why his song is so sad. In sapphire, emerald amethyst, sparkles the sea by the morning kissed, and the mist from the far off valleys lie, gleaming like pearl in the tender sky. Soft shapes of cloud that melt and drift, with tints of opal that glow and shift. The end of the story of the opal, which is super sad, but that now we know how it came to be, not why it's the stone of October, but how it came to be. I, uh, I'm sorry for springing a sad one on ya, but I do hope you enjoy today's little fairy myth, I guess we'll say. Let me 
me know if there are any other stories like this that you'd like to hear, but I do hope you're comfy, cozy, relaxed, or are in the zone if you're working on something. But no, off to sleep and dream what you will, or stay a while and enjoy another tale. Whichever you choose, I'll speak to you again, and until then, stay spooky, my friends. Good night.